Okay, scholars, I think we're ready to go. Um, today, I'm going to be making a video for you on um, analyzing the three characteristics of exemplary teaching that Dr. Ladson Billings uh, outlines for us from her research. Um, so what are those three uh, characteristics? What are we looking for? We're looking for high levels of academic achievement, high levels of cultural competence, that's the walking in two worlds, and then high levels of criticality, okay? I want you to pay close attention to both the high levels of cultural competence and the high levels of criticality. Um, of course, high levels of academic achievement is important as well. All three of them have to be present for it to be exemplary teaching. But usually teachers have a pretty good idea and are pretty good about high levels of academic achievement. Okay, and we need to get the vocabulary correct, the phrasing high levels of academic achievement. Um, for a long time, people would always be talking about a quote achievement gap, where it was like high levels of academic achievement. We saw with the leaking educational pipeline that um, whole groups of students weren't faring well, even in places like Utah, where you have a, a predominantly white population. But when uh, it comes to socioeconomic class, even when students are white, um, oftentimes that will be a red flag for um, achievement disparities. So we already learned that there's no such thing as an achievement gap, it's an opportunity gap. Uh, people are very um, bright and capable and able to learn. It's the idea is um, who is teaching them? How are they teaching them? Is it relevant to the students? And um, what kind of resources and experiences and opportunities do they have? Um, if you're teaching a child, if you're teaching my child how not to be Latinx, my child, Ricardo Alejandro Juarez, if you're teaching him how not to be um, Latinx, um, he's probably going to reject that, um, no matter what your strategies are and how much you care about him, because you're um, teaching him in a way that um, doesn't work with his identity. Okay, so high levels of academic achievement, teachers usually understand that, they, they know what that looks like, they foster that. Um, but then you have some teachers who will foster high levels of cultural competence. What does that mean? It means helping students to learn to walk in both worlds. So a lot of times teachers think, well, um, I'm using Spanish in my teaching and hence I am being culturally competent. Maybe. Maybe you are, but maybe you aren't. Maybe you're using Spanish as the devalued language in the United States, and you're using that because that's part of your students' um, cultural community wealth knowledge, their funds of knowledge, but you're trying to use that to help the medicine go down a little easier and to create them into mini-me's. Do you see what I'm saying? So that would not be cultural competence, even though you're using um, Spanish. Uh, so if you're using Spanish in your teaching and you're teaching students, well, I know that in the United States, it's devalued. Let's say you just came from Mexico and people will be screaming and saying, learn English, learn English. Um, and they won't be that excited that these people already speak Spanish fluently. They'll be saying, well, you better learn English. And so it's the devalued uh, language. And so you're saying to your students as economic refugees coming in to the United States and being primary speakers of, of Spanish, you're saying your language and your culture and your identity belong in the classroom because they belong in the classroom and you use Spanish for that, then you are using Spanish to walk in two worlds. 
So you want them to know that it's okay to be a primary Spanish speaker and successful in school. Does that make sense? So it's not necessarily that you're using Spanish, but how and why you're using Spanish. That is cultural competence. Are you helping them to be able to successfully walk in two worlds? They don't have to leave their own world. That's subtractive. Remember the butterfly girls? I'm going to take my story off and I'm going to use the teacher's story. That's subtractive. But that never helps people. People don't do well. They have a lot of trauma when you try to take away from them who they are. They are fine how they are. Every human being is an I thou. We have to treat them as a thou. So they are good the way that they came to you. And so your job is to help develop that wondrous gift that they are and help them to be able to walk in both worlds. Okay, that's cultural competence. So you do have some teachers who are aware of that and that do that. You have teachers that foster high levels of academic achievement, foster high levels of cultural competence. But what do we know about exemplary teaching? You must have all three. You can be a good teacher, a great teacher, but you're not exemplary unless you have that third element. So it's not enough to help them to just walk in two worlds. Why not? Well, because criticality tells you the why not. So remember when I was saying that if you have a student and you're using um, Spanish and maybe you're using Spanish to um, make the medicine go down and you're like, well, I know they'll learn English faster if it's in their primary language of Spanish. So you're trying to make them into a mini me. And um, so you're using Spanish and that's your medicine to make being a mini me a little bit smoother, a little bit sweeter. Um, but that's really not okay. They, the students are, um, I thou, they are thou, and they have to be treated like thou, that they are gifts to us. So um, understanding that their language is devalued, that's part of criticality. So as a, as a school teacher, when my students were out on the playground and I heard them um, speaking in Spanish on the playground, then um, I encouraged that because I had high levels of criticality and I was trying to foster high levels of criticality in them too. So they would think that speaking Spanish on the playground was a bad thing. And some of the students who were also fluent in Spanish, but had been in the United States longer, would tease the children who had just come um, from Spanish speaking countries and they were new immigrants. And so they would tease those children because they didn't know any English yet. And so knowing, having criticality myself, I, I encourage them to speak Spanish on the playground and in our classroom because Spanish is a valued legitimate language of communication. So that I knew that Spanish is devalued and I worked against that devaluing. That was in my practice. Um, I was fostering high levels of criticality that I wanted them to be able to use Spanish in, in both worlds and English. That was where I was telling them, um, you can use Spanish or English, you know, depending on where you are. Um, it, you know, you have to be able to walk in two worlds. So my understanding of the devaluing of Spanish, that's criticality. When I'm using it to help them to walk in two worlds, that's cultural competence. And I'm using um, Spanish to foster high levels of academic achievement because I know that there's a lot of things with higher order thinking skills um, in Spanish, there's words and concepts that we don't have in English that capture it a little bit better. And so for uh, uh, somebody who's bilingual to be able to move back and forth between English and Spanish, that takes a lot of higher order thinking skills. And so I'm fostering high levels of academic achievement there. So that's how I'm doing that.
Okay, so those three things, high levels of academic achievement, high levels of cultural competence, high levels of criticality, those are the three. What am I looking for when I'm analyzing Mr. Crenshaw's teaching? I'm looking for high levels of academic achievement. I'm looking for high levels of cultural competence, the walking in two worlds. I want them to know I'm looking for evidence. Does Mr. Crenshaw help the students to walk in their own world and walk in the school world? The school world tends to reflect um, white middle class standards in the United States. So that may not be my students' background, but they have to be able to walk in both worlds. They do have to uh, pass the achievement tests. So they need high levels of academic achievement, but they don't have to do that at the expense of who they are. So they can be black and successful in school. They can be Asian descent and successful in school. They can be transgender and successful in school. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's the cultural competence, walking in two worlds. Their culture is okay and great and valued and should be in the classroom just because it's a valuable resource. And then for high levels of criticality, that's where we're looking for those inequities, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you a reading that I know you already have read. And um, this is... Um, okay, this is uh, Dr. Goldie Mohammed's uh, interview that she did on the um, four layers of the historically responsive literacy framework. And so I know that you've read that. Now, remember when she's talking about literacy, she means more than about reading and writing. So if I'm computer literate, it means I know how to use the computer as a tool. The tool, the computer isn't using me in the sense that I, I don't know how to make it work, but I'm using it as a tool because I'm computer literate. OK, I remember with my first master's degree um, at that was uh, during the time when uh, everybody having their personal computer was fairly new. And um, so this was in the late uh, 1990s. It was like 1996, 97. And um, my professor was explaining to us what a desktop is on a computer. So I know that you are. Um, most of you, if not all of you, are um, digital natives. So you've been using desktops since you, before you can remember. And so um, uh, that's how uh, Dr. Mohammed is using the term literacy in her uh, historically responsive literacy framework. She's using literacy, like I'm saying, I'm computer literate. So she's using it like you're understanding how things fit in history and she uses that for teaching. So it's not just reading and writing and how to decode words. Okay, so her, what are her four, four layers? Identity, we've been talking a, a lot about that um, with the Asian descent timelines and um, poems and who I am as a woman, my identity, um, so that's important. The Butterfly's girl, her identity as a girl from the rural area as a speaker of a language other than English, um, her identity. And um, so I, I like to call my students scholars because that's an identity. And it helps me to remember that each of my students is a thou. I thou. My students are gifts to me, and I need to always remember to handle them with the love and care of a thou. And so that's uh, why I do use the term scholar, because you are so capable, and, you know, we're using our academic knowledge to really um, analyze and use these things much more than than like say student which tends to be more passive I see you as independent learners so I use that identity as a scholar for you to remind myself 
how treasured and valued you are as a thou. And then also because you are so capable and our, our task is learning together about being exemplary teachers. Okay, and you need skills, no doubt about it. You gotta have skills. There's just no getting around that you need skills. Um, intellect, this is a lot of this, like we have to be able to um, use knowledge um, and the higher order learning, learning um, skills, uh, uh, Bloom's taxonomy skills and intellect, those go together. Um, but here's criticality. This is the one where students are often confused. They will think that it's like critical thinking um, where it's a part of like really refined um, uh, thinking about something. I'm going to go a little bit more in depth on it. And yes, that is very true. If I'm critically thinking about something, I'm carefully analyzing it and looking at it. But it's more than that. Um, so what does Mohammed say? Criticality is helping students to read, write, and think in active ways. Okay, so that does sound like critical thinking, but here's the part about it. As opposed to being passive, when you ask a, a question and there's one correct answer, you just take that in as a passive consumer, right? We're, we're used to that as a dependent learner. We're used to that. We're used to saying, to our professors and teachers, well, how many pages should it be? Uh, so we want to know what the hoops are, and then we'll jump through them. We don't really think too much about the hoops. Um, so, but she's saying it's more than that. It's more than just deep thinking and analytical thinking, right? Okay, so that's part of it, but it's not all of it. And here it is. Criticality is deep analytical thinking to be understood, to understand power, equity, anti-racism, and other anti-oppressions, okay? So that's the inequities. That's what we're looking for. Um, so it does take that critical thinking as far as I'm going to look carefully at the different perspectives, but it's understanding that those different perspectives are devalued. Um, I have been in uh, um, meetings, for example, I used to be a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, which is a big research institution in New England. And um, they had monies for researchers that we had to apply for. And um, if you landed one of those grants, you know, you could use that money to fund your research. So I was there and I, you know, coming from Alabama, I like high heels. I like dresses. I like dressing up. I, I like things that you might kind of think are kind of Barbie or or girly or, or kind of traditionally feminine, even though, you know, I would see myself as someone who would analyze how uh, women's bodies have been used for the view and under benefit of others, particularly um, men. So, um, but those are systemic things. But I personally, I like high heels. I like dresses. I like um, dressing up and I like makeup and things like that. So I was at this meeting and, um, and I, you know, I got dug into my bag for something or other. And the gentleman sitting next to me was like, what are you doing here? Um, you know, this is for researchers. I, I apparently my identity, the way my body was, I didn't look like a quote researcher. And in that part of the country, um, in our environment there on campus, we had a culture where it was kind of Mother Earth, where it's like, if you wanted to brush your hair, do. If you don't, that's good too. Uh, makeup, mm, very optional for women, you know, it's just kind of go all natural, you know, and it's like, I don't have any problem with that. Do that as you will. But then please don't tell me how, if I choose not to do that, that that will be a problem. So anyway, he didn't feel like I fit into his box of um, what researcher looks like. And so um, if I'm looking at that critically with uh, criticality, um, I'm looking at, well, why does my voice and my body 
and the way I choose to purport myself, why is that make, making me um, as if what I have to say isn't serious? You know, I'm not seen as a real scholar. Like, what am I doing at this meeting for uh, applying for research monies? You know, I was totally put in this box, like you the, applying for research, that's not you. So um, my ability to analyze that was my level of criticality of looking at whose voices are heard, whose are kind of like what they're hearing gets wah, 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 you know, so, um, whenever you're looking at those kind of inequities that that is what you're looking at okay so she says they're investigating different standpoints especially from the marginalized point of view reading between the lines okay so it's much more than than just deep thinking deep thinking is part of it but you're really looking for inequities okay so you use that deep thinking, you know, who is included, who is not, why is this city like this? Like, um, for example, when I was teaching at the University of South Alabama, the city is 54% Black. Why was our um, college of education overwhelmingly white in a city that is over half Black? You know, you ask questions like that. Who's included? Who's not? Why aren't they here? You know, what, what, why do I live in a neighborhood that's mostly middle class and white? You know, so um, uh, you ask questions like that. So the, that's criticality. And that's the hard one. That's the one that teachers often have, have trouble with. Okay, so I'm going to open up now this another document that you already are familiar with. This is the Exemplary Black Educators Pedagogical Excellence Brief, which I wrote in 2020. And the reason that I wrote it was because a lot of the teachers that I was working with in Indianapolis were like, we don't have time to read a research book or article that's 20 some pages, give us something short. So um, I, that this was my attempt to give them short, something short. So you already know about Big Mama here. Um, you met Big Mama. Uh, she is in this first example. Here's um, Big Mama and Miss Mac. And then you have Mama, which is actually Mrs. Charlie Ann Brown Hayes. Okay. And then you also have, um, and I, I just love um, Mama. Uh, here. Mama has some really amazing things to, to say. And um, the, this article that this is taken from, this is the, the book that um, uh, my colleague, Dr. Hayes, and I wrote um, this chapter here called um, They Must Get It, They Must Learn. <clears throat> it's chapter four in this book. And Big Mama um, is is there on the first pages and then mama is in the next part. Um, so I love what mama says. She says um, to her students, she says, um, I'm a very serious minded person. Let me see if I, if I have all of mama here. So I think the whole thing is, is in here. Um, this part about, um, about uh, mama saying that the kids are like cake. I just, I just love it. So there's Miss Mac right there. So all, all of it, you know, this is just an excerpt of it in this document. But I really, before we go into Mr. Crenshaw, I, I would like to share this about mama. Mama, her teaching philosophy is that you are like cake. She's telling her students that you are smart, but you haven't let it all come out yet. I mean, isn't that beautiful? And so she also, um, she grew up, uh, she's the next generation after Big Mama and uh, Miss Mac. Um, so she's the next generation. And um, so she's also teaching in, in Alabama uh, and Mississippi. And this is right before 
the um, uh, Brown decision goes into effect, which remember Brown was in 54, uh, but um, it doesn't get enforced until the 70s. And so when uh, Mama, Charlie Ann Brown Hayes, when she was growing up, she remembers the Ku Klux Klan burning um, crosses at the end of her parents' driveway. And so she becomes a teacher and she's one of the teachers who is um, desegregated and she has to go and teach in a white school. Okay, um, but before before she's integrated or desegregated into another school, she's talking to her own students who are black and they are from working class communities. And so she says to them, I'm a very serious minded person. I think things ought to be structured. I don't, I didn't learn from jumping up and down. We had some fun. Yes, we had some hands on stuff, but we were very structured. You give the students homework and it's like they're writing something down in their sleep. A committed teacher will help the students learn the importance of education, force them to think critically. That's hard to do. That's the hardest thing to do because they don't want to. It's easier not to, right? You just fill out what your teacher says and you just jump through the hoops. You let them do the thinking, you dependent learner. So she's saying it's really important to get them to be independent thinkers. So she, she goes on and she says, I share with my students my situations about my children. So her son, Dr. Hayes, is my colleague. We taught school together in Salt Lake City School District. And um, so she's talking about her three children. And um, I believe two of her three children became school teachers. And um, so she says, uh, I share with them my situation and my children's. I share with them that just because you are in public housing and you're in a crowded situation, that is not an excuse not to learn. Okay, so look at that criticality. Do you see how she understands that public housing is devalued? So she's like, I understand that's very real, that society is telling you if you live in public housing, you must not be fully human, but don't you listen to that. You know, you are just as valuable so see how I'm shifting into walking in two worlds and using that walking in two worlds and criticality to push high levels of academic achievement? She says, that is no excuse not to learn. So that no excuse not to learn, okay? And that's very different than a lot of teachers. A lot of teachers will say, mm, bless their hearts, they're from public housing. Oh, uh, they won't do it. They can't do it. They're not motivated. And there'll be all kinds of deficit talk about the students, but not exemplary teachers. Exemplary teachers understand that criticality. They know that public housing is devalued. And so they know that other teachers in society has low expectations for them. And they're like, well, you can learn to walk in both worlds. Um, being from public housing is no excuse not to learn. And a lot of teachers do use that excuse if their kids are in public schooling, public housing, and they use that as a, an excuse not to teach them. So if you don't teach the kids, then how do you expect them to learn, right? So not mama, she's like, oh no, public housing, that is no excuse not to learn. And she doesn't use that as an excuse not to teach. In fact, it drives her teaching, that criticality, it drives her teaching. She knows that she's going upstream because society is saying, hey, y'all from, from public housing, you probably will not amount to much. And so she's like, no, no excuse. That is not an excuse not to learn. I give them examples of people in slavery, in spite of the fact that you get your hands cut off, you get your eyes poked out, if they caught you with a book. So she's giving them that historical context of it, right? In spite of it all, they still move forward and they still got an education and they push forward and they educated themselves. 
So look at how she's teaching them to walk in both worlds. And she's using her understanding of criticality of those inequities to foster high levels of achievement. Learn how to read. All I tell them is that, that that's what they need to do. They need to learn how to read. I let them know that the media is trying to convince them that they're stupid and can't learn. I said, that is not the case. Do you see how criticality is playing in here? So she understands that the media is every time she turns on the TV and she's seeing images of kids who are poor and they're all gangster with their pants hanging and all kinds of, you know, little bad boy and girl things. Then she's like, um, the message is you're never going to be anything. So she knows that that devaluing of if you're from public housing, she's aware of that, that the images they're seeing in society. And she says, no, that is not the case. They know I am pushing them. I tell them education is the key. If you don't like what you're in now, get a good education. I constantly talk to the children. I tell them you're smart, but you haven't let it out. See, that's what a lot of teachers don't do is they will, they, sometimes they don't say it out loud, sometimes they do, but mostly they're thinking it, maybe not even consciously, like these kids are not going to amount to much. Look, they're um, migrant children, their parents move all the time picking crops, they're not going to even be here that long, and they have all these deficit views, but this teacher mama, she's like, no, no. Uh, I understand that. That's that criticality. She understands that devaluing uh, and inequities that the kids are fa facing. And she says, no, no. Education is the way. You know, I talk to them. Education is your key. So you're smart. You just haven't let it out. You are like cake. If you take each ingredient and let it stand alone, it's not a whole lot of fantastic until you put it together see what she's telling her students each individual thing isn't that much but that's how you are you have all these little different towns but you got to put them together and do something with it so she tells them they're smart they're like cake they have all this potential okay you are like cake if you take each ingredient separate and let it stand alone it's not a whole lot not fantastic until you put it together i tell them you've been told by the media that when they show a crime has been committed and they show blacks to make you think you're a criminal and you're dishonest and you can't learn but that's not true do you see the criticality there she knows that the kids are getting all these images of themselves as negative, as criminal, and you, they start internalizing that, and then it's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So she's saying, stop. That is not the case. You are like cake. Well, you got to let all that, that goodness and all that brilliance out, and education is, is your way to do that. So she says, um, uh, I tell them, you've been told by the media that when they show a crime has been committed, they show Blacks to make you think you're a criminal, you're dishonest, you can't learn, but that's not true. There's no sense in you playing that. See how no nonsense there? They're warm but demanding. Uh, I love you, but you have to rise to the bar. And I'm so grateful that I had teachers like that when I was in graduate school. I had a teacher, a professor during my first master's degree, and he was like, Brenda, this is not your best work. And he held the bar up here and I rose to it. I knew he was telling me the truth, that that was not my best work. I was like sliding by. Well, maybe I'd been used to kind of sliding by with my not my best work. And I still did pretty good. But he was like, pretty good isn't enough. I want you to excel. Put all your gifts together. You like cake, let it out. And so from that time on, I got straight A's. I, I really pushed. If it wasn't my best, 
I did not turn it in. I left no points on the table. And I'm so grateful for a professor for like calling me to the table and saying, you know, this is not your best. So teachers make a big difference. Um, and mama says, black children need strong people. And that keeps me coming. I started teaching at the college level in order to help us other black people to have better teachers. I needed to go, go to an all black college to help inspire young black people to become teachers. So that's kind of in, in what her background was. Um, but as you know, with uh, Dr. Uh, Ladson Billings, not all of the teachers in her study were black. Those exemplary teachers, some of them in that study were actually white also. And the teacher that pushed me was white also. He was a white man at the University of uh, Utah. So, um, you know, exemplary teachers come from all different backgrounds and you can be one too, but you have to understand high levels of academic achievement, high levels of criticality, and high levels of cultural competence. I know I got those in, in the wrong order, but they all do work together. Okay, so that is, um, so that is mama. I, I, it, it, I never tire of reading about how she talked to her kids about being like cake. That really means a lot to me. Um, I have another uh, article that um, Mr. Crenshaw's uh, teaching comes out of and um, Mr. Hayes. And you see this, here's um, this, you see Mr. Crenshaw here. Uh, let me make this full um, screen here. Let me see. Yeah, okay. So here we see um, explaining how he understands his role as a teacher and the significance of education to his students. Mr. Crenshaw describes how he approaches implementing African-American pedagogical e excellence. Okay, so... Um, that Mr. Crenshaw's story and then his friend, Mr. Hayes, um, another exemplary black teacher, uh, they are in an article that Mr. Hayes' son, Dr. Hayes, Big Mama's son, um, that we wrote called We Were There Too. So um, I thought I had that on my desktop, but I don't see it. Oh yeah, here it is. Let me see if I can open that. Okay, so we were there too, learning from black male teachers in Mississippi about successful teaching of black students. And we're talking about black students here, but um, because black students are part of that leaking educational pipeline, um, when you adjust it and you talk about like, let's say that we were in San Juan County in, um, Utah, and we're on the uh, Diné homeland, and we're um, talking with, uh, working with Navajo children, then, you know, we're still looking for high levels of cultural competence, high levels of academic achievement, and high levels of criticality. So we just happen to be talking about it in this context um, right here. So that's an article that, that we published. I think this was in 2014 when we published that one. So you, you're welcome to uh, look at the actual uh, story that or article that that came out of. Okay, so let's look at Mr. Crenshaw here. All right, so what's, uh, there's Miss Mac. Okay, so. Mr. Crenshaw, he says, this is Mr. Crenshaw talking. So remember, we're looking for high levels of academic achievement, high levels of cultural competence, and high levels of criticality. My philosophy, this is Mr. Crenshaw, for education is probably taken from a quote from Horace Mann, okay? Beyond anything else, education is the great equalizer. And that was what it was supposed to be, right? Um, has it ever been that? Uh, that's debatable because the education pipeline is still leaking, but he's pointing to that. Education forces a person to recognize talents 
or uh, dis ed education forces a person to recognize talents or to discriminate against them, then the whole world would know why one is being discriminated against. I grew up with the white philosophy that we are basically Negroes and not capable of doing anything but dancing, singing, and having babies. Can you already hear the criticality? Do you hear that devaluing? Um, yeah, yeah, that, that all we're good at is singing, dancing, playing football and having babies out of wedlock. Um, when I was a kid, uh, President Reagan made famous the idea of the welfare queen and that was a stereotype of black women, even though actually the number of um, women uh, that would be on free and reduced lunch and, and food stamps would actually be quantitatively be white women simply because that's a bigger population in the United States. So, um, but nevertheless, the idea of the welfare queen um, came from that. And we still hear those kind of stereotypes. So right there already, we're seeing criticality. See how you can kind of look for and read and watch for that. Okay. And at that time, people could not get away from that argument because we blacks were not educated. But on the other hand, um, but on the other side of that fact is that we were not educated because we were denied the right to be educated. Hmm, criticality again here, right? Why are the babies in the river? So you're seeing all the babies in the river that they don't seem like they're able to do much more than sing, dance, and have babies. But you have to look up river. Why are the babies in the river? And there you see that, um, you know, that it was actually against the law to educate Blacks. And then um, when it wasn't against the law and you had desegregated schooling, separate but equal did not mean that it was equal. So all the hand-me-downs, the uh, different kinds of things, it was definitely not an equitable education. So you see the opportunity gap already coming. And we're talking about in the 1970s. So that is not that long ago. Um, people from uh, two generations ago are, you know, still dealing with that. And then they are raising their children and grandchildren. And you see that the working class kids get working class jobs and it kind of keeps repeating itself. So we're not that far away from that at all. Okay, so he goes on and he says, I think philosophy wise, I would tell the kids that education can be and has been some, despite some shortcomings, he knows that, that there's a leaking educational pipeline. It can be the great equalizer. Um, in my classroom, I do the mentor piece with students. I also really do that work on developing my students' abilities to think critically and be able to look at a situation and make the best informed decision. Now that's looking like we're getting higher order thinking skills, right? So we're like, mm, might mark note that we might have to come back to that. Uh, once I established myself as a premier social studies teacher, my tongue got a bit more loose. The first years of teaching with white students included with black students, I had to be very, very careful so as not to appear prejudiced or biased towards the black students. I had to be sure that I didn't say anything that could be misconstrued. So you had social studies combined with reality, what I call real world stories where you as teacher can relate to students because you are all in the same boat. The students I know understand where they're coming from because I do. They know that I care because I do. So when they desegregated the schools, we lost some of that ability to really educate our kids, black youth. I mean, really educate our kids in a way that could, they could make an informed decision and learn that white is not always right. Um, when I see the kids in the community, I provide them with that necessary mentoring. It can be as simple as telling students what classes to take, what will get them into college, or at least give them some choices and advocate for those who can't advocate for themselves. Woo, okay. Now that's just a couple of paragraphs here. 
But let's see what, what happens in his classroom. Um, how do we, can, can we find any evidence for, for high levels of, does he foster high levels of academic achievement? Let's see if we can see any evidence for that. Okay. So, hmm. He's saying, I do that mentor piece, but I also really do that work on developing students' abilities to think critically and be able to look at a, the situation and make the best informed uh, decision. Hmm. Now, I would say there's some evidence for that there, um, right there, that he's pushing the students to develop abilities to think critically. If you think about Bloom's taxonomy, I'm going to use that as my evidence, that that sentence there, that Mr. Crenshaw really works on developing students' ability to just think critically and be able to look at a situation and make the best informed decision. So in order to do that, that takes a lot more than the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy. If you think about Bloom's taxonomy, which is just like, uh, recall, list, some of these lower level skills. We need those skills in order to do the higher order things. But the higher order ones are where you're applying, evaluating, synthesizing, um, creating something new out of what you have. So in order to be able to think critically and make an informed decision, that seems to me that they have been looking, they have been doing all the lower level thinking skills, and then they've been considering different perspectives, and they've been evaluating and setting um, like goals, like what does it mean to for this to be an informed good decision, right? You have to think about, well, what do I mean by that? What is good? How do we define that? So that's a lot of higher order thinking skills. And that sounds like a lot of analysis, a lot of um, different perspectives. And plus he also says that he uses real world stories, right? So to me, it sounds like he's really um, fostering higher order um, thinking skills, which is um, fostering higher levels of academic achievement. So notice that I picked out my evidence there and then I explained to you how that evidence shows that Mr. Crenshaw is fostering high levels of academic achievement. Okay, I got that one. Um, is Mr. Crenshaw fostering high levels of cultural competence? Let's see if he is. Okay, so what does cultural competence mean? Is he helping them to walk into worlds? Um, I would say that there's evidence that he does. Um, here he says, when I see the kids in the community, I provide necessary mentoring. So it can be as simple as telling students what classes to take and give them some choices and he advocates for them. Okay, so, um, and then he says that um, he really does the mentoring thing. So um, he's saying that, uh, what does he do? As a, as a social studies teacher, his tongue got a little bit more loose. And um, so definitely here he's saying, uh, with the white students included, I had to be careful not to appear prejudiced. But what he's doing is helping them to learn to walk in both worlds. That's why he was um, loosening his tongue with his black students, because he was like, I know that, you know, I understand your background and you understand mine. Uh, he says he's from the same, he has this, they come from the same boat. So he's like, there's nothing wrong with the boat you came on. But this boat over here in school, you got to go, um, you got to be able to walk in both worlds. So he uses mentoring 
to help the students to walk in both worlds. So there's my evidence that he does mentor students that, and as part of that mentoring, he's not teaching them that there's something wrong with them or something wrong with their culture or their background or their community. It is fine. It is full of richness and cultural wealth and funds of knowledge. But you also have to walk in the school world too. You do have to pass the SAT exam if you wanna to go to college. You know, to have opportunities, you have to walk in both worlds. So he uses mentoring to do that, to help them to walk in both worlds. So I've showed you my evidence and then I've explained how my evidence proves to you that Mr. Crenshaw does foster high levels of cultural competence. Does Mr. Crenshaw foster high levels of criticality? Yes, I would say that he does. By him understanding and part of his mentoring is that he knows very well that there's a devalued look at the Black students he's working with. He knows it. He's saying, um, you know, that people look at them as if um, all they could do would be to sing and dance and have babies. So he's very aware of that deficit view of his Black students. And um, so his awareness of that devaluing drives his teaching. So he's trying to teach his students, I know that you're getting this message that you and your families and your background are not valued, but I'm telling you that you are. So um, I understand that inequity. In fact, um, I relate to it because I was on the same boat too. So whereas cultural competence is using that understanding of criticality to help them walk in both worlds, Criticality is recognizing that that inequity exists and using that to drive your teaching. It doesn't give Mr. Crenshaw the reason he needs to not teach these students. So a lot of teachers would be like, well, you know, they're from the hood. You know, all of them are just all they're going to do. They think they're going to play football and um, they probably won't. Not that many people make it to the NFL. Uh, even if they do make it to college. So um, that's a pipe dream. They're probably not going to make it. And so they don't put much into their teaching because um, they use that as an excuse not to teach. Now, Mr. Crenshaw, on the other hand, he knows very well that they are being devalued. And he uses that to drive his teaching. His teaching is for countering that devaluing of his students. He wants them to know, no, I see that uh, inequity. I see it, I know it. And um, education is your way to work around it. And so he, the inequity and knowledge of that inequity is what drives his teaching. That's the criticality. So I would submit to you that um, Mr. Crenshaw does have high levels of academic achievement, high levels of cultural competence, and high levels of criticality, okay? What about Mr. Hayes? Um, Mr. Hayes says, success is an attitude. Let that attitude remain by itself, or you can build on it by doing something about it and what you want to do. You can have an attitude and you've just got an attitude. Well, now what happens if I take my attitude and I live and I expand? You've got to expand, expand, expand. I ask my students, what do you know? What's on your mind? And they say, I want to be a welder. And I say, what does it take to be a welder? What do you want to deal with? And they say, uh, go to school. Uh, I say, what's the problem? Everybody wants to be Kobe Bryant, a superstar black athlete. Everybody wants to be Hank Aaron, famous black athlete from Mobile, Alabama. Um, oftentimes I have to go into the classroom to do damage control. When we see these white female teachers who are afraid of the brothers, black male students, and they look for an excuse to kick the brothers out of class. Now, don't get me wrong. These brothers are hard. A lot of them are coming up from Detroit and Chicago to live with their grandparents in Mississippi and Alabama. I had this one guy who had come down 
to the south from Detroit and he was hard and he was angry and he was in this teacher's classroom and the two of them had gotten into it over something. And this guy was not even my student, but I happened to be in the hallway when she kicked him out of class. Now, if he got sent to the office, he was going to be suspended and kicked out of school, which have made him even angrier you know that's a self-fulfilling prophecy it's expected for this brother to get kicked out of school so i grabbed him and i said let's go for a walk let's grab a coca-cola and talk and this gave him a chance to cool down and hopefully resolve the situation i had to give this young brother i felt it was my obligation to give this young brother some guidance on how to deal with his anger with years and years of being what he considered to be disrespected at school Imagine that. Uh, yes, teaching students history is important, but something I learned from my own teachers, uh, that mentorship is just as important. Students were where they are and moving them to the next level. I think that many teachers today have lost task, sight of that, and they are too worried about test scores, and they don't worry enough about the souls of the kids. Okay, let's see. Can we find evidence of high levels of academic achievement, high levels of cultural competence, high levels of criticality? Okay, so um, where can we find it? Hmm. He's saying he has a lot of conversations with the students, it sounds like. Um, in both cases with Mr. Crenshaw and Mr. Hayes, both of them have a lot of care for their students and they demonstrate it maybe different than I do as a white woman. I have this kind of like, I always wanna hug everybody and um, you can't do that in, in uh, public institutions. You know, some people don't appreciate that. They want you to stay outside of their boundary of personal space. Um, but that it looks a little different for me than it does for Mr. Crenshaw and Mr. Hayes. So, but they definitely both show that they, they care, right? They're warm and they're demanding. And so I would say that my evidence that he has high levels of academic achievement is when he's saying that they have to expand, that they can have this attitude, but they have to expand. Well, we know that learning requires to expand and move out of your um your comfort zone. Learning requires movement. You have to be uncomfortable. You have to get out of what you know. You have to venture into the unknown. And uh, maybe you become a novice at something and you're not used to being a novice. And so learning is about that expanding. So there's some, some effort, I would say, learning is fundamentally about expanding. And he, he says that a lot. You've got to expand, expand, expand. And then he talks to them about um, uh, what do you want to know, what's on your mind. And so look at how he starts with the learner, not the lesson plan. He uses what they're thinking and their questions to guide his academic achievement, right? So his lesson plan is all about this expansion. It's about um, what the students are interested in and what they, what's on their mind. And he doesn't discount anything. What? What would it take? You want to be a welder? He doesn't discount that. They talk about that. Well, what does it take to, to be a welder? What do you need to do? What do you need to deal with? Okay. And so, so he's like um, fostering these high levels of academic achievement by helping them to see themselves as successful in learning as learners. And so I would say that this point about expanding and these conversations, that sounds like a lot of higher order thinking skills. I can imagine that they're having to learn the um, lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy um, in order to do the higher level things. Like think about being a welder, right? You have to know all kinds of things about physical science, about chemistry, about architecture, um, uh, you know, just mechanics. Um, there's just a ton of, of physical science there. Um, so I would say that he does foster high levels of academic achievement. Does he foster high levels of cultural competence? 
Yes, I, I would say that he does. Um, like Mr. Crenshaw, he talks specifically about being a mentor. And if you're a mentor, you don't want people to just walk in the new world. You want them to be able to walk in both worlds. So he knows that the students are coming from different areas, from different backgrounds. And he even says it right here. We have these white female teachers and the problem is not that they're white and that they're women. The problem is that the white female teachers tend to have different life experiences and cultural backgrounds than do the black students. And so there's this mismatch between them and it's causing conflict. And particularly with these young men who are feeling very disrespected. So in order to walk in both worlds, I would say that simply by um, helping students to be able to think about, well, how can I control my, how can I um, manage my anger, you know, um, they they probably are being disrespected at school, but uh, uh, you know at the same time as Mr. Hay said he would be suspended and then kicked out of school, and that's going to make the problem worse, right? So how to help them to be able to walk in both worlds? The that is what Mr. Hayes is doing. So I would say that his um, mentoring and the what what he calls doing damage control is he's trying to stop that leaking educational pipeline where all these kids are from school to prison pipeline. He's like, I'm going to stand in the way of this school to prison pipeline. And with this particular example of this young man from Detroit, he like literally pulls him away from the spout of the uh, leaking educational pipeline that he was just about to get sucked into the school to prison pipeline. And he's like, let's go for a walk. Let's talk. So I would say that that his example of how he mentors and talks with them and does, quote, damage control, he is teaching them how to walk in both worlds. There's nothing wrong with you, but you do have to walk in this other world, too. OK, so he's a history teacher. So, wow, lots of things from um, the past to be able to um, make sense of and understand and learn from in the present with that. So I would suggest to you that there's lots of evidence here, particularly he gives us his mentoring and damage control. And I'm telling you how I'm explaining to you how his damage control and his mentoring helps to help the students to walk in two worlds. And thus, that's going to contribute to their high levels of academic achievement. Does Mr. Hayes have high levels of, of criticality? Again, I would say that he does. How do I know that? What's the evidence? Well, um, for one thing that he knows he has to do um, damage control. He knows that the uh, white teachers are afraid of in many cases and don't know how to work with their black students. So what do they do? They kick them out of class and they contribute to the leaking educational pipeline and they blame the students. Okay, so that issue of this unequal treatment, and we know that, um, for example, in Alabama, um, black students only make up about 14% of all public school students in the entire state, but they make up about 90% of the students that are ex expelled from class and sent to detention and so on. So the, they're overrepresented in school discipline. And so, um, you know, that is criticality right there that if it's Joey doing it, well, boys will be boys. But if it's Jamal doing it, well, then we got a baby gangster on our hands here and he's got to go. And so Mr. Hayes understands that his understanding of that inequitable treatment of the students is what drives him to go mentor. He plucked that young man out 
because that young man was like to his uh, white teacher uh, telling her, well, you're not going to disrespect me. And of course, whenever you get into a power struggle with a student, that is a lose lose situation every time. Okay, so I'm sure that teacher just did not know what else to do. So she was like, you got to get out of my classroom. Okay, so she was just making the pipeline, the school to prison pipeline, the leaking educational pipeline worse. She just contributed to it, even though I'm sure she didn't realize it. But Mr. Hayes understands that inequity, and that is what is driving his teaching. He's saying, yes, yes, high levels of, of test scores in history, that's all important. But start with the learners, not the lesson plan. Yeah, they do have to pass tests. Yes, they do have to walk in both worlds. But there's inequities that the, these kids are facing, and they're being sent down to the south and living with grandparents or whomever and they go to school and they, they're just angry and they they feel disrespected and so they know that they're being devalued and so Mr. Hayes knows that too and so he uses his teaching and his mentoring and his interactions to interrupt that hence he does he does have high levels of criticality he understands these inequities that the students are facing and he uses that um, understanding to drive his teaching. So instead of kicking somebody out of the classroom, he actually snatches them for a walk and to cool down and help them learn how to productively handle that. What could they say the next time when the teacher um, of their homeroom classroom or whatever it is that he just got kicked out of, um, when he's feeling disrespected, how could he handle that so that he isn't being kicked out of class? Because who pays the price? Not the teacher. The teacher already has her degrees. So it's the young, it's the students that pay the price. And Mr. Hayes knows that. And so he's working against that. So the teacher in here that kicks out one of the brothers, um, uh, she doesn't, she uses it, um, criticality to not teach. Mr. Hayes uses his criticality to teach. It drives his teaching and drives his work for cultural competence of walking in both worlds. And that drives his fostering of high levels of academic achievement. Okay, so I have provided you with evidence for each of the three characteristics, and then I have explained my evidence about how this evidence actually shows that these teachers have been fostering high levels of all three of the characteristics. Okay, now that's what you have to do when you are analyzing um, Mr. Hassan's uh, teaching. So Mr. Hassan, his teaching is the very next one on this document. Okay. So you're going to do that one on your own. And then I am going to grade it because I am going to, let me see if I can get this to go full screen for me. Um, what I'm going to do is I am going to, um, that will be on your um, quiz, on your school uh, practicum quiz. And that will be, that's a skill that you have to have for your um, final school practicum project. Okay. So I hope that was helpful. And I look forward to seeing what you have written um, for your um for your uh, answer in how you analyze Mr. Hassan's um, teaching for those three levels. Okay, all right, here we go.